thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, you already got to the right place and you already know about uh, our uh, presenter this evening. Uh, but let me just say, I'm Robert Tycott. I'm the president of the Tampa Bay chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America. If you are not a member of the AIA local chapter, uh, please see me afterwards. I can give you uh, the uh, email address or whatever that you can go and sign up for that and be on our regular uh, notification list of various lectures and so on. Um, and we do have one every month uh, or so, usually at the Tampa campus, but obviously also here at the Tampa Museum of Art uh, as well. Um, and uh, I want to go, and I'm not going to say anything about the particular background and all, but you know that Bronco uh, is the new curator uh, here at the Tampa Museum. We are so happy that this has finally uh, worked out. Uh, and all of that, and that we can all go and have a face-to-face -face, uh, lecture uh, and so on. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, introduce Bronco Van Osten, uh, who's going to give a talk here on Hellenistic ceilings. Thank you. Uh, before I start, uh, thank you all, of course, for coming. And if you would like to sign up for a newsletter about antiquities related events at the museum. There's a little sign-in sheet at the door. If you haven't, uh, please think about signing up for that. Also, of course, we have mu museum membership. Um, and um, I know that this event started a little after closing time, but upstairs we have two galleries and a promenade with antiquities. So since you're interested, if you haven't visited the museum in a little while, consider coming back uh, to check out our exhibitions. Um, there's one particularly in the promenade uh, that is uh, a lovely collection of Lebanese antiquities that I think you'll be uh, fascinated to see. So today we're going to dive into a very nerdy subject, uh, hardcore archaeology, so to say. Uh, also uh, a subject that um, I'm talking about because I'm uh, particularly interested in it for various reasons. Um, to give you a little bit of background, um, we're talking about ceilings from Egypt dating to the Hellenistic period, uh, a collection of originally around 800 clay seal impressions that were divided up into two collections, one in Amsterdam at the Allard Pearson Museum, where I used to work before I came here, and the other at the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. Um, I actually became a volunteer at the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam because I wanted to get up close and personal with these seal impressions. That was my chief reason of getting a foot in the door. Uh, and I bucked the director for several years until we finally got a research project started and financed so I could uh, start examining these clay seal impressions. Um, they um, are important because they have uh, a great number of ruler portraits from the Hellenistic period um, that can help us identify later Ptolemaic kings and queens. I will get back to that, of course, in a bit, um, but a little bit further background. Um, Sealing documents or sealing property is something that is as old as writing. Uh, in fact, some of the first forms of writing were in the form of seals. Uh, you could seal a document, you could seal uh, your property, a room, a tomb, uh, uh, anything that you wanted to secure, um, uh, documenting, uh, sir, excuse me, securing a document could be so that it moves from person A to person B without a third party reading it, but you could also seal an object uh, to store it in an archive so that uh, it cannot be changed until uh, reopening. There are a lot of different kinds of devices that can be used um, for uh, making seal impressions. Here you see uh, a nice cylinder that you can roll out and then the impression will continue and continue. The scene will start repeating. Um, that's a very old version uh, of making seals. Uh, it can be with a stamp. A very popular form is in the form of a scarab uh, with uh, at the bottom an impression uh, engraved. 
signet rings uh, are perhaps my favorite. Uh, they can come in any kind of material from precious metals like gold, silver, bronze, uh, but also cheaper ones from uh, uh, even bone. Um, the um, sealing of a document is illustrated in this slide. Uh, documents were usually made of papyrus or parchment uh, that you then roll up or fold up, and then you tie a ribbon around it or a thread. Uh, with a lump of clay folded around the thread, and then you impress it with the sealing device, a stamp or usually a signet ring when it's a personal document. That could also be done by several different persons. For instance, the person who runs the archive, the person whose document uh, it is, and maybe even a witness. Sometimes there's a lump of clay on it with 10 or 12 different uh, uh, signets to sort of notarize that that document has been seen by all these various different people. Um, so uh, an archive, uh, I, I use this word, that's a modern term, of course, but an archive can be of a private individual, uh, documents pertaining to that person's life or that person's business. Uh, there were also state archives or city archives where uh, documents pertaining to that city or the, that region's government were held. Temples could have archives, but every archive could also house someone else's documents. If you have a loan or another agreement, you wanna maybe keep a copy and then you place it um, for safekeeping in the city archive or a temple archive. Um, the period that we're talking about today is the Hellenistic period, let's say, the last three centuries before the common era. This is a period that began in Egypt with the conquest of Alexander the Great, the Macedonian king who campaigned against the Persian empire around 330 BCE. He uh, uh, added Egypt to his kingdom. After his death, um, one of his generals, Ptolemy, uh, also a Macedonian, um, established himself first as governor, uh, 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 eventually as king, and the dynasty that ruled uh, uh, until the end of the Hellenistic period is called the Ptolemaic dynasty because every single king in that dynasty is called Ptolemy. Queens are either called Arsinoe, Berenice, or Cleopatra. There are three Arsinoes, no, sorry, four Arsinoes, four Berenices, and in total, seven Cleopatras. Uh, Cleopatra the seventh, that's the famous one, uh, the last independent Hellenistic ruler um, until the Roman conquest, um, when the in Roman Empire uh, ruled over the entire ancient Mediterranean world. Um, Alexandria became the capital under the Ptolemies, but we are talking about Edfu, a city in southern Egypt, south of uh, ancient Thebes, Egyptian Thebes, uh, now known as Luxor and Karnak. Um, on the map, you see Alexandria all the way at the top. Um, Cairo, modern day Cairo, is at the tip of the, the delta. And you see Edfu all the way down. Uh, it's just north of the uh, modern day Aswan Dam. Um, in Edfu, there was a, uh, a temple dedicated to the Egyptian god Horus, uh, the falcon god, the son of Isis and Osiris, prototype or archetype uh, uh, of royal sovereignty. Um, and uh, of interest to us is that this temple complex uh, received major rebuilding finances uh, ranging from uh, Ptolemy III through, um, can't read it, but you can, Ptolemy the what is it, 12th? Um, so a very major significant uh, um, rebuilding program. It is one of the best preserved Egyptian temples, but remember this was built when Macedonian rulers reigned in Egypt, an indication of their dedication to Egyptian traditions for one. Um, so we're talking about Hellenistic ceilings that were um, divided up into two collections, one in Amsterdam, the other in, uh, uh, in Toronto, Canada. 
Uh, Charles Corelli was a, an archaeologist who um, was also the founder of the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, most of the uh, of the ceilings in Toronto were eventually uh, published in the next 10, 20 years after he purchased uh, his half. Not all, uh, but most, uh, and most were very briefly described. Um, they divided up the task between two authors, and uh, one of them focused on Greek themes and the other on Egyptian, but because in the Hellenistic period, you cannot neatly divide that up. There were issues of interpretation that they missed because some items were not as Egyptian or as Greek as they thought they were. Um, the collection in the uh, uh, Allard Pearson Museum was originally purchased probably around the same time uh, by Baron von Bissing, the first German and also the first Dutch Egyptologist. Uh, no, not first German, but one of the first German and certainly in the Netherlands, the first Egyptologist who um, uh, had a vast collection of Egyptian uh, material and these ceilings were part of that. Like I said, I tried my best to convince the director uh, to apply for funding so that I could study these. Uh, the, the ceilings in Amsterdam hadn't been published very much. Uh, they had been studied in the 90s. Um, my hope was, and I still uh, have that hope, to publish all these ceilings into a catalog with uh, much uh, more detailed descriptions and commentary. But it's a lot of work. I've studied them all. Imagine in this picture, I'm sitting there doing research. Uh, I've studied them all, described them, but I need to still work it out. And uh, one of the main problems is um, that there are in total almost 800 of them. Uh, and sometimes you think, I've seen this one before, and that's because they're also duplicates, but you don't remember. I'm not a computer. I can't remember everything. Uh, so there's a lot of work, but it's very fascinating. Um, the, uh, the project also allowed me, and I will return to that in a little bit, uh, to organize some workshops, a conference, uh, participate in other events, uh, bring together a network of experts um, to help me uh, and to help the world um, bring these seal impressions to a wider audience. Um, so I mentioned that the reason why I was so interested in these seal impressions is because there are so many royal portraits from this period in this uh, series. We have coin impressions, uh, uh, sorry, we have coin portraits of the early Hellenistic kings and queens. Uh, you see all significant portraits in this list. Uh, and then the last that we have is of Cleopatra the seventh. Um, so we have Ptolemy the first through Ptolemy the sixth and most of their wives. Um, and then for the second half of the Ptolemaic period, we do not have, um, how do I say that? Uh, uncontroversial portraits. There are a couple of coins that could be interpreted as being portraits, but they aren't uh, incontroversial as these are where the coin simply says, this is Arsinoe II, uh, or this is Berenice II. Um, so that was my hope. Like, can we examine these seal impressions and identify the later Ptolemaic kings and queens? Um, I, uh, like I said, organized workshops and conferences to invite uh, experts, um, one of them being in our midst, Bob Bianchi, to help me understand these coins. Another is a dear friend of mine, uh, Catherine Lorber. She might be on Facebook, and if so, hi, Kathy. Um, we published an article together where we examined all the female portraits and ask the question, is this person a human being or is it a goddess? Uh, and in many cases, uh, we are talking about portraits of Hellenistic queens, of Ptolemaic queens portrayed as a goddess, uh, goddesses uh, from Greek and from Egyptian traditions, Aphrodite, Demeter, Hathor, and Isis, uh, maybe even Artemis. 
Um, and we were able to identify all the Ptolemaic queens from Cleopatra the first, the second, the third, Berenice the third, and Cleopatra the seventh. And you might say, hey, I'm missing a few Cleopatras. Correct, there is no Cleopatra the sixth. That's a modern figment of imagination that in my uh, idea uh, is not a historical figure. Cleopatra the fifth is a shadowy queen who disappears from uh, our records. And Cleopatra the fourth uh, was never queen in Egypt, even though she uh, uh, had children that were part uh, uh, of later kings and queens. This is an illustration of how we work. We have a seal impression in the middle. How do we know who that person is? Well, you compare it to a coin that you know res uh, resembles it, and that coin will tell you that's Cleopatra the seventh. The same is what um, archeologists or art historians have done uh, with the bust that you see um, uh, that resembles the coins of Cleopatra the seventh. And when you put the three in a row, you, you, you see the resemblance. Uh, in fact, I think that the coin and the seal that comes from probably a bronze uh, um, uh, signet ring, that it is made by the same person or the same workshop because the details are so identical. Um, what no one expected was that this guy was also among the seal impressions. It is one of the most spectacular of the seal portraits um, because it, you can't see this in a photograph, but the head is very three-dimensional. If you turn it around, you have almost half a face looking at you. Um, it has exactly the same hairstyle as some of the famous Julius Caesar busts. Um, of course, we have no idea what kind of document would have been placed in a temple archive in Atfu that would have Julius Caesar's portrait on it. Um, so that is just a matter of speculation. I can add that this must have come from a very precious, uh, probably golden signet ring uh, that must have been really deep. I mean, there must have been a really big bevel on top of it to um, have a portrait of this three-dimensional quality. There are no attributes around the head that identify him as a Roman statesman. Um, so it's him as a person, as a private individual who must have left some document, God knows what, uh, in the temple uh, at Atfu. Um, when I found this seal and showed it to the director, this is when he said, we need to get you money to, to do more research. Um, Kathy Lorber also examined the male heads. I think um, probably one third of the full collection of seals shows male heads. And um, it is an enormous task to sort out, to, to figure out which are duplicates, which are similars, which are different kings. Kathy did all that work and then realized that approximately she had as many heads as we anticipate having kings. So that was good news. And also uh, the ones that she identified with the smaller series were the, the kings that ruled short and the longer series are the ones of kings who reigned long. So that too was good news. It seems to sort of confirm uh, our ideas. Um, and so uh, through that, comparing it with, um, with coins that I mentioned before that are sort of crypto portraits, where there's a coin from uh, Cyprus where Ptolemaic kings often ruled as kind of vice governors. Um, there are coins where suddenly the head of Dionysus becomes particularly Ptolemaic in its features. Uh, and so that is likely that the king has asked, could rather than having a generic head of Dionysus, could you maybe work my portrait into it? Um, there are also some young heads, probably when uh, a king has been, uh, sorry, a prince has been appointed as heir and successor by his father, and that they would issue uh, these coins here, um, signet series uh, to send out to maybe officials.
You also see here uh, in the top middle that Ptolemaic kings were portrayed uh, as Egyptian pharaohs. And there are a whole lot of other themes um, beyond portraiture, but I think in total, um, something like half of the series uh, are kings and queens. There are a couple of other human figures. Um, uh, one may be a Roman governor, but there are a lot, a lot of other themes. There are Egyptian deities. Um, here, uh, uh, at the top corner, you see uh, the, the falcon god Horus, very common in the series and confirming that this is a, a collection of ceilings that come from the Edfu archive. Um, but other Egyptian gods too, sometimes Bob Bianchi wrote about this, is the, without a name, you wouldn't know what you're looking at. Uh, there are images uh, that are traditional pharaoh pharaonic images uh, of a god spearing his enemy. But who could that be? That depends on the location, it depends on the user, if you recognize this, that, or the other Egyptian god in it. Um, sometimes attributes may help identify, but often Egyptian uh, gods can only be identified if there is an actual name written on it. Uh, one of the uh, prime examples is that Isis is often depicted in the Hellenistic period or earlier with the sun disk and cow horns, but that crown is actually originally from Hathor. And uh, so unless it says specifically that it's Hathor or Isis, you cannot know, you cannot know for certain. Also Greek gods, Apollo, but Horus, the Greek god, uh, the Egyptian god was identified by the Greeks as Apollo. So when we see the head of Apollo, did the wearer think that that was Horus or Apollo or both? Um, Heracles, Hermes, uh, goddesses like Demeter, Aphrodite, Artemis, Athena is quite common. Um, so it's a, a nice uh, indication that all the way south in Egypt, Greek or Hellenistic themes are popular as well. Um, this I like animals, uh, both from Egyptian tradition. Uh, there's an ibis. There's also, I showed it earlier, uh, a taweret, which is a sort of composite deity of uh, hippopotamus, lion, and crocodile. Um, there are uh, mythic creatures from uh, Greek mythology, like the griffin. There's also a dog who is not sleeping. His head is on his paws, which means that he's a waking dog. Uh, there's a horse, there's a gazelle. I, th I think I, it's not in this series, um, but also an owl standing over an amphora, um, uh, the owl referencing probably the, um, uh, the Athenians. And there's a, a bee with um, some grapes, so probably a reference to a grapevine. Um, what have we here? Some further objects. There's a grain, uh, an ear of grain. There's a, a, a tree, probably a date palm. Um, and there are some military objects. There is one that looks like four squares with a, um, a semicircle. Uh, it might be perhaps a military camp, sort of a basic outline of a military camp, just guessing. Um, but close to Atfu, there actually was a military camp called uh, uh, Arsinoe. Um, there's a thunderbolt, there are some religious objects, um, there are some harpoons with uh, Ankh signs next to them. Um, and then there is a, a whole series of Egyptian hieroglyphic texts. Uh, most of them are related to uh, priestly titles. I'm imagining that these were uh, individual seals with which priests would seal their documents. 
They're often not particularly legible because they were worn. Um, and uh, the few Egyptologists who have looked at it could also not always figure out exactly what they uh, refer to. Uh, but this one that you're looking at right now is particularly interesting because it's a cartouche uh, that is the, the sort of rope with a royal name uh, wrapped within it of Sesostris or Senustret the third. That is uh, more, more than 1500 years before the Ptolemies even uh, uh, claimed kingship in Egypt. So how can that be? Um, one explanation could be that the art deal, uh, the, the, the antiquities dealer who sold this to Corelli and von Bissing had a few other pieces and thought we'll better get rid of them, um, give them both an equal 400 pieces. Um, but we know that elsewhere in the Mediterranean, Egyptian scarabs were popular of the Thutmosids. Um, they were found in Tunisia, in, in Carthage. They were found in Italy, in Etruria. Um, so it's not, it is not impossible that scarabs uh, were reused in later centuries. But you realize that, oh, I'm moving the wrong way. That me sealing with a, a cartouche of Senusret in the late Hellenistic period would be the same as me using a, seal, uh, a signet ring of Constantine, uh, the, uh, the, the emperor, uh, right now, right? The, the, the difference in time is uh, comparable. Uh, two more very important uh, and huge uh, seal impressions. I think the one on your left is about six, seven inches. The other is, uh, if I remember correctly, 10 or 11. Um, this is a hieroglyphic text that um, in the cartouches, in the sort of ropes, mentions the royal name of Ptolemy X. All his ancestors are mentioned in the hieroglyphic text. And from the, uh, the, the information at the bottom, we can see that this is from the second period of his reign. So it's very clear uh, when this, uh, uh, this seal was made. Uh, and it must have been uh, an important document to be sealed with this uh, enormous uh, uh, stamp device. The other one also has a cartouche, but in it, the goddess Isis is mentioned uh, as being the lady of Philae, an island uh, in the region of the Aswan Dam. Um, a cartouche means royal person. So this says the royal person Isis, the goddess, who is the lady of Philae, um, has stamped this. I. Uh, I hear from Egyptologists that this happens, but I don't understand what it means to say that Cleo uh, not Cleopatra or Ptolemy to whomever, but the goddess Isis is the ruler. Um, I was uh, uh, fortunate to uh, organize workshops. Um, uh, two of them, uh, experts in my field, in Hellenistic ceilings came to Amsterdam. We talked about how do you present these objects that are gray and small and dull and seemingly uninteresting. How do you present them? Uh, how do you interpret them? How do you uh, know that this was an actual hoard that was found together? Or how much of that is a story that a dealer cooked up uh, to maybe uh, 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 sell them at a better price. I had a, a, a workshop, uh, sorry, a conference to wrap this all up. Um, that was a, a really special event. Um, but we also brought in uh, students from the um, uh, University of Applied Arts in Amsterdam uh, to ask them, like, how would you do this? Uh, and one that struck me was that we, we assigned them a room. It's like, this is the room where you can do it in. You pick uh, if you want to have one seal or a hundred. It was all up to them. And there was one group that selected just the one single seal up on a vitrine with one spotlight on it and a button that says press here. 
And then when you press, a video presentation would be projected on the walls. It would explain the iconography of what you're looking at, uh, why someone would have a signet ring with that iconography. Uh, and it would also point, this is completely accidental, that the museum in Amsterdam had an engraved gem with the same iconography on it. Uh, so they did everything and more than I could expect. They had darkened the room, they had, or uh, this is all part of their uh, small scale presentation, of course, you had to open a curtain to get in, but it's really like, this is how you pull in someone who would otherwise like, oh, boring, pass it by. This would pull, pull them in uh, and would allow them to later say, oh, there was an engraved gem. Now I need to find that engraved gem. Um. But there was no budget for an exhibition. So this is uh, what we did. We pulled out the drawers from storage, put them in a vitrine, but we also had a few other attributes, a uh, sort of replica of a document with a seal wrapped around it. We had a magnifying glass in front of the seal of Julius Caesar. We made a 3D scan of the seal of Cleopatra and had it enlarged a couple of times. Um, um, but yeah, we didn't have the budget to go all out and follow the advice of, uh, of all the people who had um, given us feedback. Um, and then I said, uh, the end of the research project, um, or at least the fi financed part, uh, allowed me to organize a conference. Uh, again, Bob Bianchi was there, Cathy Larber, who I mentioned was there, uh, and a whole range of other experts who all wrote about their um, expertise in Hellenistic ceilings. Um, and you might be surprised that there are actually quite a number of us. Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity. The book got published. Um, my copy is still in, uh, uh, on its way in a container from the Netherlands. Um, but um, even during a pandemic, uh, we managed to, uh, to get it edited and published. And I'm uh, really quite proud of it. And also it came out about 25 years later uh, compared to this French uh, publication by uh, an earlier generation of experts on the same subject. So uh, it, these are two, I think, bookends, first publication on Hellenistic ceilings and a second uh, that gives an update and uh, also shows you that the number of Hellenistic ceilings that are now known has exploded. Um, before uh, the first publication, archaeology Archaeologists often didn't even mention that they found that they found ceilings, uh, seal impressions. It was considered boring, uninteresting, unimportant, no historical relevance, uh, and uh, if they were saved, they were kept in an archive uh, without further information. Um, so the earlier generation, those uh, that were still alive, were very, very welcoming in uh, participating with the younger generation. And the attempt has been to engage us in a sort of consortium, a network of experts who try to bring this collection, it's now at least 250,000, only of the Hellenistic period, to a wider audience. If only through photography, digital scans, uh, preferably in 3D, in high resolution, on some kind of overarching uh, hub, a platform online where people can at least see them. Um, then you can start thinking about adding metadata, information, descriptions. Um, and uh, one of the dreams that we have is to have image recognition software behind it algorithms that say, well, if this is Aphrodite, then this is probably also Aphrodite. Or did you know that this ceiling is uh, identical or similar to the other one? Um, have not been fortunate to get funding for this. Uh, another pro problem is that uh, words for ceiling are different in each language, and they all have slightly different shades of meaning. 
There is a book, I think, published in the early 90s that tried to make a formal vocabulary for uh, not just ceilings of the ancient world or of the Hellenistic period, but ceilings in general, because every human culture has seal impressions. Um, that book has gone nowhere. Uh, and if you open it, you realize that um, I'm Dutch, so I read their suggestions like, that's wrong, that's wrong. No, that's, you miss nuance. And this is the strange thing. And it is very complicated that if you want to make metadata multilingual so that people from Spain or from China can also use it, then you need to have experts sitting on the table. And then someone from the Byzantine period will come and say, I need a separate category for crosses. And they will have 250 different sub items that fall under crosses. If you're from the Bronze Age, you're like, I need maybe two under crosses. Uh, and uh, you are a half hour later and the conversation has stranded. Um, maybe I should have given this earlier, but this is a map of the uh, Mediterranean with all sites marked where Hellenistic ceilings have been found. Not sure if you can read the small print, uh, but it means from Carthage and Sicily all the way to present day Afghanistan, everywhere. And now that uh, scholars are more aware of it, they just keep coming. Uh, so the earlier generation, those who were at that conference in the 90s, had a feeling that they could manage. Uh, there are sites where one single site, they have 150,000 ceilings, not just from the Hellenistic period, okay, but still, there is no way any one person or even 10 can ever hope to examine them all, describe them and publish them. That is simply impossible. But we want to get them out, to have the public be aware of them and figure out a way of how to do that. Um, also, when you have an overarching website platform like that, you can start adding the actual engraved gems to see if you could find the match. Over here, the red engraved gem is from the LR Pearson Museum and shows you what looks like a Janus head, but there is a, a pie and a mu. So the pie refers to pan, it has horns. And the other one must be Marcias, a satyr uh, who, um, <clears throat> among other things, played a very good flute, and uh, Apollo didn't like him for it. Um, the seal impression, this is the seal impression, uh, the, the engraved gem that I was talking about in the Alar Pearson Museum. We have a very similar iconography. First you think, oh, it must be Janus, but we're not in Rome. And it's the same kind of uh, satyrs um, uh, conjoined. Um, uh, and if you have a website, you can do a lot of with it. If you have three D scans, people will be able to turn it, twist it around, uh, and uh, see it from different angles. You can then add information to it. What is it that you're looking at? Um, you can. Um, should you ever find uh, a match uh, in a signet ring or an engraved gem, you can bring in that information. Um, it is of course never as good as the real thing, but it will bring it to life to a much wider audience. Um, so um, that has been uh, my little saga. It's still an ongoing process. Uh, the catalog, as I said, is not finished. Um, my primary motive for researching them were the Ptolemy queens, kings also a little bit, um, because that is my personal uh, area of interest. Uh, but the more I got to learn about them, the more I realized these are often very inaccessible objects they're lying in an archive or in a museum drawer somewhere. No one pays attention to them. Uh, and even in museums where they do make an effort, people pass them by because they think they're dull, gray, small, and uninteresting. 
how to bring that to a wider audience, not only of experts and students, but also uh, beyond, um, and to get people as excited as Piper, who, who, yeah, shout out, an art handler who is, ceiling impressions, wow. How can you bring that passion uh, to a wider audience? That has been the, the thought on my head uh, and why I give presentations like this to try and share. Um, I'm sure that I could speak a lot more the, than you care for, uh, but there's one more thing. Uh, I could not have done this on my own. This is just a, uh, well, not random, but it's a selection of people who have helped me uh, with my research, with uh, writing articles, with giving advice. Um, there are people who you first meet as scholars, as experts, they become dear friends. Uh, and I thank them all very, very much. Uh, some of you also know that uh, over the last week and a half, uh, I nearly lost my eyesight. Uh, fortunately, it's temporary, uh, but this presentation would not have been possible if Clara, my wife, um, wasn't willing and patient enough uh, to make it with me. So thank you for, uh, for your time and for your attention. Thank you for coming. Uh, 